Hey everyone, and welcome to our talk about Cube Burned Out and how to get things done efficiently within the Kubernetes community. I'm Sasha. I'm now contributing to Kubernetes since five years, and I'm mostly working on sync release and sync node topics, but everything around container runtime. So if you want to have a chat about this one, then I'm happy to talk to you about it. I'm also trying to bring the community forward by acting as CNCF ambassador and my three-year-old son uh, told me that I have to find a controllable dump truck at KubeCon. So if any one of you knows where to get one of those, then I'm happy, to, uh, happy for the help. And I'm really excited and really honored to be here today with Carlos. Hey. Hello, everyone. And uh, thanks for coming here and walking this long distance, like kind of hiking stuff that you need to go up and down and, and find the room. I almost lost the room. But uh, my name is Carlos. I also work together with uh, uh, Sasha in the SIG release. I'm one of the tech leads together with Adolfo here in the front. I am also was a, uh, my former uh, Kubernetes uh, steering member. My shift ends this, this year that we have the, the elections. Uh, I also work on the SIG store. Like, uh, if you don't know SIG store, like, come after me, then I can explain a little bit more and I work for uh, Chainwright. Today, we're gonna talk about this uh, five, five points here, and then we're gonna walk through, and then uh, I'm gonna start where, where the, the starting point, right? Like, when we, what uh, we're gonna talk here, it's uh, gonna be applied for Kubernetes, but uh, you can extend this for any CNCF project or any open source project that you may or uh, is contributing. For Kubernetes, imagine like, oh, okay, I want to contribute to Kubernetes. What should I do? Like, <laughs> I go to the web page, kubernetes.io, I go to the Kubernetes, Kubernetes in GitHub, and then I start figuring out things like, okay, what's, what's going on here? And then I discover that's like, there's more things to try to discover and learn. There's the Twitter account, there is the community forums, there's the Slack, uh, the Slack, uh, Kubernetes Slack and Kubernetes CNCF. There is the Stack Overflow, and there is the also. Then you find this uh, contributor course. Then there's a lot of stuff that is going on. Then you find there is like a, Kubernetes have two GitHub orgs. There's Kubernetes and Kubernetes Six. There is more, but let's talk on only these two. And then you try like with, there is a bunch of projects there. Then like you like. What's going on here? Like, where should I start? Like, real start, right? I would say, uh, and that is my experience and Sasha's experience, like, you find a SIG that uh, you like it. Like, you maybe have, like, a, a, a good overview in, in, in documentation, let's say, and then you go and see and check it out that. My experience uh, before Kubernetes, I was learning Go, and I found, like, a nice project that uh, I would like to contribute, but uh, I didn't know like uh, how to code in Go like properly. Then I start like doing reviewing uh, documentations, and then after that, like I feel a little bit more comfortable doing that, and then I start doing the the coding. But uh, here in, in Kubernetes, we have several SIGs, and several in those SIGs they have a different parts of the Kubernetes project that they take care. If you scan the QR code, you're going to see the full list of the SIGs we have currently today. Okay. You pick a, a SIG where, like, you, what you're going to do now. Like, I, I, like, for my experience, like, you, sh you should try to attend the SIG meeting for that specific SIG. Let, let's say, let, let's talk about the SIG release one. You start to talk, uh, attending that meeting that we have, like, every week in a we try to put that in a good time for that's going to be good for everybody. And uh, you go there, maybe in the first time you're just uh, listening, and then the next time you start asking questions or clarifying stuff. Understand the project and understand the issues they, they have in the current project that you are looking for, and uh, like see the roadmap of the things. During the meeting, like usually the, the meeting, the when it starts, like, do you have a space to introduce yourself? Then you should do that, like, and, and um, say, 
what you're doing there and what you go, do like to learn. If it's not possible to attend a meeting because you have a company meeting or the time is like ter terrible for you, I would like maybe just watch a few recordings from the previous meetings to see how is the meetings and what the people talk about there. As well, like uh, every SIG should have like, a, most of those SIGs have uh, like a handbooks that describe the SIG and the work and which the sub-projects. Recommend also to read that. Check the repositories, the issues like in the PRs. The PRs is a good point to see what's going on in, the, in that project. And uh, like uh, if you want to contribute in the code part, like read the code. That uh, helps you a lot. And uh, like educate yourself, like let's think like you choose a, uh, what you like to do. Like you need, if you like are more comfortable and not changing that much, check what you like to do. If you like um, want to know more, go to a SIG that maybe you can improve a little bit like yourself. And or like I'm, a, I'm gonna be very wild here. I'm gonna do, try to learn something that I don't know, like right? And then, Go and uh, like uh, see that the things that as an open source project, you are not getting paid for that. Then you might not choose the things you don't like. It like I like, for example, uh, CI, CD, and this uh, releasing engineer. Most of the people I know they hate this part. Like uh, they sound sounds boring and stuff. For me, it's very exciting. For me, the part the the part I don't like is the signal and the scheduling. I said, I'm not gonna touch that part, and like, maybe in the future, maybe not. I, I think never. Okay, then like, uh, fail fast, like this is the, like we do in, try to do in CI, right? Fail faster to get feedback. When you start contributing, like, try to work in small changes, in small PRs that you like you can, like, discover how the, the CI, and in our case in Kubernetes, how Pro works. Like, there is a lot of, a lot of stuff to, to understand on that. And use the PR, the feedback review from the maintainers to improve your PR and your code and your skills as well. Uh, this is, uh, is good to like establish some routines. Like uh, I put some examples here and uh, I did like some stuff of this because I, I for me was, uh, was good. Like uh, I start doing like uh, doing my uh, contributions on Kubernetes. I start before working like maybe one hour, two hours before or after working, and then I switch this to every Thursday and Friday after my work, and then eventually I, I prefer doing the, during the weekends. I'm talking this if you are not getting paid to do this job, right? If you are just a, like an open source contributor and doing your, let's say, in quotes, in your free time. Uh, why are you contributing? Like, make your work public and transparent. Like, you, as, you get an issue to work on, put, the, like, try to, not every day and every time, like, but to try to put a status, like, where you are, what are you doing, if you are stuck or not. Let people, let the maintainers know, like, don't, uh, the, like, try to get the issue and just uh, disappear and no, not providing status, because then uh, you are maybe blocking uh, someone that wants to work on that issue, but they are waiting for that. Like, okay, oh, that's Sasha is working. I'm gonna not, not not gonna touch on that issue, but uh, he is not working at all. Like, try to be as we do in our uh, paid jobs. You need to provide status in open source. Also, it's a good practice. Like, provide some, a little bit of status, and uh, to that people can know. And if you are stuck, that they can help you as well. Uh, after you do some work, like uh, celebrate the small achievements for yourself and if you are, like, if you like to write a blog post, I don't like to write blog posts, but uh, if you like it, do it like this and public the, the things you did and try to, to celebrate this. And also recognize the others, like it's, it's a good motivation for everybody. Like you do a lot of stuff and most of the things are invisible. And if people recognize you, it's a, like, it's a good motivation to continue working. To try to, it's okay like to say as everything, like it's okay to say no, like if you start contributing and then someone, okay, can you take this issue? Can you take that one? Can you start working these three different issues? If you don't, if you cannot handle this, okay, I'm, I'm only gonna take this one. Don't take that like 10 issues at once that maybe you're gonna 
burn out really fast. And it's okay to take breaks and like long, short, uh, whatever you want. Like just to let people know I'm gonna take like a, a month off, not gonna do anything here, and just uh, relax a bit. Because in the end of the thing, you need just to try to enjoy yourself and make the open source contributions like good for you, and not like a burnout and you start burning later on. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, one thing I'd, I'd like to add to the previous slides is that getting uh, overwhelmed is probably one of the most common reasons for burnout. Um, the thing is, you can get easily overwhelmed in Kubernetes even if you're just contributing since 10 years because I just have to look into the source code of a different special interest group and then you are already there. I think the, the main message behind it is that um, setting the right focus to be less overwhelmed is probably a good one. Yeah, so now we we are contributing, and we are contributing since a couple of months, maybe a year, and then we would like to become an expert in our problem domain, so how can we do that? It's simple, right? We just write a cap and merge that into Kubernetes. There is a great talk uh, from KubeCon NA last year from Ricardo and Carlos about uh, how to get this done, or how to not get this done. It kind of summarizes that working on Kubernetes enhancements just takes a lot of time. Um, if you work on a dedicated enhancement or graduation, then you have to meet all the deadlines in the, re in the release cycle. And all those features have to be graduated and also maintained as well, which also means that they have to be deprecated probably at some time or you have to enhance the tests and stuff like that. So the overall more conservative approach in Kubernetes makes it really hard to get experimental features in. Um, there are some way around that, uh, but in general, it is more appreciated by the community to graduate an enhancement rather than just creating a new one. But why should I even care about enhancements, right? So I'm a contributor, I'm lucky with my life, why should I even work on enhancements on Kubernetes? And we really believe that enhancements are a great opportunity to grow into a specific area and have an expert domain level knowledge uh, where others can also contribute from. So this helps the helping the community to succeed as personal success. That's always one of the main paradigms of open source development. You have something distinct to celebrate, so you just don't have to celebrate that you squashed 10 bucks to your last week, but you can also say, hey, we get this alpha feature into the release. And you work also more closely together with other maintainers, which is one of the best reasons to be part of this community. Um, and you also learn to understand the project politics, which is important to avoid burnout from my perspective. So this means that enhancements are generally great to establish a more permanent footprint in the community and uh, it is really important to avoid being burned out on them. So how to start an alpha enhancement without getting burned out. So it's really important to do the necessary pre-work. So the special interest group should be a supporter by the overall idea you have probably. And you can also, you have to research the reasons for the current state of the enhancement. So many enhancements which seem obvious uh, are not obvious at all. Um, you have to connect the end user stories to reduce the complexity. One example is the first enhancement I was thinking of in Kubernetes was, a f it was probably five years ago or so, was to get the image pull progress into the CLI. So if you pull a, create a workload in Kubernetes, then you get no feedback at all about the image pull progress until the workload is created. And this look sounds good, but it is not important. So this use case is not important enough for Kubernetes to get it done. Um, this can be this can be a reason for burnout, but there is another use case which is pretty interesting. So you can connect the pull progress to the timeout when the pull happens. It means you can get uh, you can produce feedback for the kubelet that the pull is still in progress, but it's slow and this will avoid the timeout on image pull and will make everything faster. And this use case is more important than the actual CLI use case. And uh, a community member kind of picked up this work and now we can probably get it done in one of the next releases, which is great. 
So what do we have to do? We have to outline the enhancement draft in Kubernetes slash enhancements. And this kind of all already outlines that you are waiting to drive the work until the end. But we have to leave enough room for iterations. Um, not everything should be set in stone uh, as an alpha enhancement because it should be always the possibility that the enhancement kind of conflicts with other interests or that the special interest group had a different idea. And this can also lead to that the whole enhancement gets stuck in a different, uh, in a certain direction. And this can also lead into like getting burned out on this topic. So the whole idea of uh, initial enhancement creation should be like decoupled from the release process. So there are no deadlines, nothing at all. You just get a feedback, do the pre-work and outline what is the idea. And now the next goal would be to get the enhancement through the release cycle. And it can feel like getting stuck in a traffic jam because there are so many different parties involved. You have to meet all the deadlines. There are other enhancements which want to be merged as well and uh, resources are kind of busy. So there are bottlenecks in resources when it comes to review, for example. And I think the most important part to not burn out on an enhancement is to make progress over uh, over time. And this is the, the mental aspect. So if you get stuck in a traffic jam, then it can be really, really depressing. But if you're still, if it's still rolling at least a little bit, then, then it is, it's not that bad at all, right? So we have to propose the enhancement for a release cycle. It means we have to get approval from the special interest group and also identify possible supporters. Always good to have a, another pair of eyes working through the release cycle on the enhancement. Um, there's always the risk if, if you work alone on an enhancement that it slips the release or that you get sick and you can't work on it and it's really not, not nice from that perspective. So setting personal goals for the hard deadlines within the release cycle is really important. But uh, yeah, and then, then we can basically start, start hacking on it, right? And the main, main idea is to surf ahead of the wave of deadlines, which means that being ahead of the deadlines, like having the docs early in place, having the tests and also the, the source code changes as early as possible in place for review, um, will not necessarily lead into that you get the review, but you are prepared for it. And that's the, the mental model, which actually helps to get enhancements done. And yeah, then there's the most challenging part, like not, not getting bound to external dependencies. Um, this is really hard and tough because there are always external dependencies. If you need API review, then you basically have a bunch of people like uh, three or two right now, which do actually that. So this is a hard external dependency you have to get like as early as possible. And it's really important to leave enough time to celebrate. I mean, if you, just matched a deadline, this is also a reason to celebrate. And you can also say, okay, I just want to lean back one or two days to live with that celebration effect in my mind, other than just continuing and working on, because it's really daunting to uh, not to celebrate something, but then instantly start working on the next thing. Now we have an enhancement merged. That's great, uh, but we also have to graduate it. Like there are different policies in place when to create an enhancement and what it actually means. But um, if we want to create an enhancement, which is not written by yourself, then it's really important to understand why an enhancement has not been created yet. So there can be different aspects of that, like there are conflicts or the previous maintainer burned out on the enhancement uh, or the SIG is not really interested in the use case anymore, or the use case is not important for the company anymore, uh, but maybe some other people are interested in it. So we can then start proposing the graduating to the special interest group to uh, understand the background of it. So it is also, it's just a standard. We demonstrate the will to drive the effort, and we always, uh, we also rework the cap ahead of time. And it is really important before graduating an enhancement to considering to step back if the complexity is too large. Otherwise, it is really likely that the enhancement will just not graduate at all over time. It changes ownership and the more ownership change we have in enhancements, the less likely is that, that it will get done um, at, a, at a certain point. Uh, but in general, this is more work than actually 
implementing an enhancement from my perspective. So graduating features is definitely more appreciated by the com community um, compared to introducing new ones. So I think the goal for Kubernetes should be to have all features in kind of a stable state at some point. Then, then we can probably release Kubernetes 2.0. So. <laughs> so, and the next thing to level up, which really, which is really important from my, from our point of view, is like mentoring new contributors, um, onboarding new folks in the community is ex extremely essential for for having a sustainable community. And the thing is, um, you can also start mentoring others by not 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 on a one-to-one -one, uh, basis, but you can also start by leaving the right breadcrumbs in the GitHub project. So connecting issues. Um, outlining problems so and connecting issues and enhancements is really one of the little tricks to uh, connect issues together um, in a way that others can follow the path to the root cause of the problem. So many issues are caused by others and you can say, okay, if I link them together, then you have a, like a mental, a mental line to follow if you want to find out why this is the case and why this issue still exists. You know, all those issues where people ask, why is it still an issue and why does it exist? Every maintainer who has to answer this question have to uh, crap through, through all the issues which are available in the project to find out the root cause. And having the breadcrumbs, the breadcrumb in place really helps with that. The other thing is um, you can also offer people uh, to help them directly and discuss more complex topics. Um, this also leads into, you can help undecided people to find the right, right areas for possible contributions. So this is more on a one-to-one -one basis. And also um, on the next step of that, which is also probably a success story, I'm not sure. Let's, let's find it out in the future. But like the Linux Foundation mentorship program, many special interest groups participated in that. And um, it needs an isolated piece of work for the mentee um, and dedicated mentors. So it's really like a one-to-one -one or one-to-two mentoring. Um, so it's definitely a, a chance for everyone to get new, men, uh, new contributors on board in the community. Yeah, so, and then we have, you can yourself also look for more advanced roles within the community like demonstrating commitment um, to your personal areas of interest. And I think it's really important to speak about the personal areas of interest. If someone says, okay, I would like, I could see you as chair for this in this special interest group or as technical lead, then you have to ask yourself, does it really make sense for me? Or what would it change if I would be a chair? Would it change anything at all? Do I have more possibilities to, uh, to help the community when I have this role? And this, if this is not the case, then it's probably not the right role for you, right? But on the other hand, there are smaller things available, like you can yourself, propose yourself to be owner of some parts of the source code. Um, some people really try not to do that because I think they, they may think it is unwanted, but I'm pretty sure that every special interest group would be happy if they have more owners on code uh, for certain areas. You can also participate in the CNCF tags. Um, they are pretty new, but they provide a more general overview about the uh, project itself. And they are like not only Kubernetes related, but also kind of have the general overview about the complete CNCF landscape. Oh, and you can always uh, consider running for the yearly steering committee election. But really, you have to ask yourself, what would it change for you? What If, if it's just more work to fulfill a role, and if it's not like exciting, uh, but it just looks like more work, then it's probably a slight indicator that you can burn out in this role. But if you have a great vision for what steering should do and what they would, should achieve in the, in the future, then just run for the election. Uh, I'm happy to, to elect you. <laughs> so speaking about politics, I think this is um, one of the most important uh, topics when it comes to burnout. Um, many companies, so there are not that many companies contributing to Kubernetes in a really broad way, but all those companies have interest in moving the project into various directions and they want to have their own uh, special footprint in certain areas of the project. Um, and 
if there's a not, I'm not talking about features, but uh, slight changes to the project, and you wanted to implement it, and nothing happens in six months, and then from one day to the other, it magically uh, happens somehow. So how could that, how is that possible? This is probably driven by company politics, so there are many people involved who can, yeah, who already have ownership over the code, and they are able to get things done if more efficiently than a single contributor like me. Um, but if it's not your company, and even if it's in your company and you're not, not part of your de department or something like this, then it's probably outside of your circle of influence and then you probably don't have to, take, don't have to care about it. Like, I think the, the most important reason is here to avoid being tracked into other companies' problems because if you make them to your problems, then it's really hard to get, uh, to get anything done if it's just driven by company politics. So I think the best way to work with this is just being aware that it exists in large projects like this. And um, it is really important to balance the importance of topics, right? So if it's really important for a company um, to get something done in a different direction, then I should ask myself if probably my direction is not the right one or if I should just step back from the topic itself. And this brings us to the next topic, stepping back. And it's really important. It's, I think it's a strong skill to be able to step back. Um, but if you are not able to move a topic forward because of external dependencies, for example, or if a topic does not add any value to your work anymore, I mean, this can happen just from one day to the other if priorities change, or if something just basically feels draining um, because you worked for too long on it and that does not really make good progress from your perspective, or priorities have changed, not only on work, but also in personal life. For example, if you can't contribute anymore this many times to drive a feature, for example, during a release cycle, then this is uh, uh, always a good sign. You can also step back. But um, it is really important to com communicate that commitment to the community continuously, so you can just reach out to them and say, hey, I don't have... I don't have, basically don't have interest anymore in working on this, so I will not do it right now. So being able to step back is really a strong skill and helps to, to maintain also the bigger picture of the overall, um, of the overall project. Yeah, you, you can't know everything, but the community can. So experts from all over the world on, work on Kubernetes, like we heard today in the keynote, so you can just utilize them to solve your problems faster than you can do alone. So understanding the project structure is really essential for this kind of knowledge exchange. And um, as Carlos already mentioned, self-educating yourself to ask the right questions to the right audience is really a skill. Um, but you will also get to know people and their working domains, for example. Um, Sometimes it's not enough to raise a question in the Slack chat of the special interest group, but if you definitely know who knows the answer to the question, then you can reach out to them to Slack. But uh, the thing is, finding the right questions uh, that nobody has really asked before on the project moves the project forward, and finding the solutions to those questions uh, will possibly lead into innovation in the project itself. But this also means that we have to find the right timing for the most success. Um, Timing those enhancements into the release cycle makes people work more efficiently together. So the release team is, from my perspective, one of the highest efficient teams in the Kubernetes community. Um, but it also means that proposing enhancements at the right point of time will make people listen. If a, an enhancement is probably too early or too experimental, then people will probably not listen. But if technology changes, like everything moves into the AI direction, then we can have probably more and reason to talk about topics like that, and then we can also propose enhancements into that direction, and people will listen then. And also raising the questions at the, at the right time improves the chance to find the right answer. So I think the key to success here, especially who is not working in US time zones, is establishing an asynchronous work style, and this will also make people more likely to work together with you. So one example for that is, uh, if you chat with someone on Slack and pull them into like being available before asking the actual question, will is like and makes the asynchronous work style synchronous, and this is really not recommended from our perspective. So you can also make the question as specific as possible 
then shut off your computer if you're, for example, in the US or in the APEC time zone. And then you probably, if the question is good enough, you will get a great answer on the next day and you can start working on it. But this, this is just one example, right? So we have all those um, different ways of working and many maintainers work in different, have different work styles they prefer. For example, I don't, I don't really prefer to get pinged about GitHub pull requests because I triage all my GitHub issues per day. Um, but there are other, other folks which, which are kind of happy with that work style and there are also special interest groups which are kind of happy when you um, put pull requests or review for pull requests into their Slack channels. So it's really, it really depends on the working area and I think finding the right uh, way to, to provide the information to the contributor or to the group of contributors is really a key to success here. So our final thoughts on that are I think we should just follow the main principle of helping others to succeed. And this is the way how to contribute to any open source community and without uh, actually expecting to get anything back, you will get automatically something back when everything, everything is went well. And avoiding burnout from the beginning is absolutely not simple. And this also means that, for example, your routines you have established over, over the last years um, may be training now at days. So re-establishing or re-evaluating those routines is really the key to um, not burn out over time, right? So there are indicators which are pretty obvious, like feeling constantly overwhelmed is probably a key indicator for burnout. But there are also some other indicators which come over a longer period of time and those are the most critical ones from my perspective. So this means that those habits which we write today may be training over months or years. And you always have the possibility to step back. I mean, there, are, there could be consequences, like if it's work-related, but in the end, you can always uh, say, I can't work on this anymore because it's just too draining, I burn out, so I just have to step back. And yeah, I think making constant progress is uh, on the personal high-priority topics is the most important part because if it's not high priority for me, even if it's high priority for my employer, if it's not high priority for me, and uh, I don't, and it's, but it is high priority for the employer, then uh, I will probably burn out on this topic if I don't make any progress at all. And also, this is one of the hardest parts, avoid being dragged into the problems of others. So this is, uh, comes, plays directly into the uh, company politics role. But I think all in all, we can say that, that the mental health of us, and of course our physical health, is the most important part of us in our professional career because we have to do it for a couple of years more probably. So we should invest in it continuously and re-evaluate what we, what we have achieved and what we will do in the future. And that's it. Thank you. We have two minutes left. Do we have one or two questions, maybe? Yeah. I was wondering if, like, either you, you, how close do you feel you've come to burnout yourselves? Sorry? How close do you think you've come to burnout yourselves? Just, I take it's quite a personal talk, and does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, being aware that burnout is one of the biggest problems of our industry is one of the key points here. Um, I think nobody is really free from burnout, so it doesn't go from, from zero to 100, but um, I think nobody is free from it and we should uh, work and identifying what burnout means and how to work against it is um, really, really the key. So for, for example, as I had no kids and I was working like five years in the industry, I had no issue with working uh, after hours or on weekends. So the time was still was just available. So it's still easy. But changing that to, for example, um, not working on weekends anymore, just trimming down the working time to, let's say, up to, up to 6 p.m. or something like this totally works. Um, because, but it also means that you have pre-invest in it and find a good asynchronous work style. And you also have to communicate that work style with others that you that you don't that you're not available in the evening anymore. But uh, that doesn't make us slow because <laughs> I can start with a fresh mind if you have something to ask. <laughs> right? Do you want Do you want to add something? No, you're gonna take more than five seconds. Yeah. 
Okay, cool. Then thank you and enjoy the rest of KubeCon.